Hey everyone, I am Dr. Sipache Basit and of course for today's lesson, we shall be talking about the major infectious diseases of humans. So we will be talking first about the overview of human infectious diseases. So pat we have already discussed what we mean by pathogens, right? So when we say pathogens, um, pathogens are microorganisms that can cause diseases and usually we can categorize two general category of diseases. The first one is due to microbial intoxication, and the second one is due to infectious diseases. Okay, so when you say microbial intoxications, um, primarily speaking, it means that um, you are affected by the toxins being secreted or being produced by these particular microorganisms. So if we're talking about bacteria, it could either be in the form of endotoxin or exotoxin, um, there are even uh, mycotoxins for fungal, for for fungus, and even um, toxins being produced by red algae, for example. Now, when we say infectious diseases, um, infectious diseases are diseases that are caused by pathogens following colonizations of some body site by the pathogen. Okay, so first step is, is of course there would be colonization. Meaning to say, um, these particular pathogens would be invading our body. Now, some infectious diseases affect more than one anatomical site, and some pathogens move from one body site to another during the course of a disease. So that's the reason why, in our previous discussion, we talk about um, an infection being local and an infection being systematic, okay, or systemic, okay. Now. In this particular in this particular chapter of course as an allied medical student um, you should be familiar with the following terms relating to skin and infectious diseases of the skin okay uh, for example um, what are the different um, infectious diseases that may affect our epidermis and dermis um, as we all know these are our two layers of the skin and then of course um, an infection or inflammation of the dermis, uh, we call it dermatitis. And then, of course, um, there is a particular gland that produces sebum in our skin. Uh, we call it the sebaceous gland. And whenever our follicle is infected, okay, or inflamed, uh, we call it folliculitis. Now, if the follicle is in the eye, and then we get infected, we call it sty. So, in 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 Tagalog, um, we call it um, kuliti, okay? And then, of course, um, we have pharyngeal, carbuncle, macule, papule, pustule, and vesicle, okay? So, you have to be um, familiar first with the anatomy of the skin. So, I think um, you have already learned this in your, in your um, anatomy and physiology class, okay? So, as you can see, um, these are these are the different layers, uh, these are the different terms that may be associated with the skin infection. First illustration here is an example of a macule. Okay, so whenever I hear the term macule, macule, as you can see here, is somewhat like flat, distinct, and discolored area of the skin. And usually, if you will be measuring this discolored area, um, this would usually be one centimeter, less than one centimeter wide or in terms of its width. And it doesn't involve any changes in the thickness or texture of the skin. So the areas, as what I told you a while ago, the areas of discoloration are larger than or equal to one centimeter. So if it's, if it's larger than one centimeter, we do not call it a macule, but instead we call it patches. Here in figure B, uh, what you can see is actually a papule. Now, how different it is from the macule? So when you say papule, papule is somewhat raised. So as you can see, there is a raised portion here. So raised area of skin tissue that's less than one centimeter, okay, one centimeter around, okay. So a papule can have a distinct or indistinct borders. So I hope you can see, uh, Take a look at my cursor. You can see that there could be a distinct border here, okay? 
It can appear in a variety of shapes, colors, and sizes. It's not a diagnosis or or a disease itself or a disease per se. Okay, papules are often called skin lesions. So these lesions are essentially changes in your skin's color or texture. Take take a close look at the illustration here in Figure C. So you would notice that it is somewhat filled with fluid. It is primarily because we called it a vesicle. Okay, so vesicle is a small fluid-filled blister on the skin. So a close-up picture of purpose soster skin lesions. So I would notice that there would be um, somewhat, uh, somewhat fluid. Okay, inside this particular, inside this particular um, skin. So. If you will be looking at the cross section, so here uh, it is actually fluid filled. So this fluid filled sacs, so this is the sac that contains fluid, can appear on your skin. So the fluid inside these vesicles may, may be sac. sometimes it is clear, white, yellow, or sometimes it is admixed with blood. Okay, so that is a vesicle. And of course, the last thing that you can see here is a pustule. Okay, a pustule, okay, is actually a small blister or pimple on the skin and it contains pus. So that's the reason why um, you will see a yellow discoloration here. So it represents the presence of pus. And as we all know, pus is actually made up of dead leukocytes or dead WBCs in response to local inflammatory process. Now, uh, we have given the overview of the infectious diseases of the skin. Let's now talk about the overview of the infectious diseases of the ears. So, there are actually three pathways for pathogens to enter our ear. So, the first path is through the eustachian tube or the auditory tube from the throat and nasopharynx. So usually, um, if we have upper respiratory infection, so our ear may somehow be affected. Okay, number two is via the external ear or canal. Okay, and of course, number three is via blood or lymph, especially if the patient has sepsis. Therefore, we can, we can actually use the following terms, such as otitis media. Um, it is the infection of the middle ear. Okay, so perhaps in Tagalog, you may be familiar with Luga and there are several different etiologic agents for this particular infection. And then of course, we have the otitis externa. And when we say otitis externa, it is the infection of the outer ear canal. Now, um, you have to be familiar, of course, with the component of the outer ear. So the outer ear is, of course, made of your pina. Okay, this is the one that you can actually see. The external auditory canal. And then the tympanic membrane. Okay, so the tympanic membrane is here. Okay, so that's the reason why you have to, have to be careful whenever you are, you know, using your cotton buds. Sometimes um, there are tendency that we might actually tend to push our buds or ear um, uh, so, so hard that it may even damage the tympanic membrane. And then the ossicles of the middle ear are the malleus, the incus, and the stapes. And then, of course, the inner ears are made up of the semicircular canals, the cochlea, the vestibule, the eustachian auditory tube. And here, as you can see from, from the eustachian tube or the auditory tube, it is now directly connected to your pharynx, which is made up of the upper respiratory system okay now that is the reason why infection of the upper respiratory tract may even extend up to your ear okay so we really need we really need to brush up our anatomy lesson okay so let's now talk about the infectious diseases of the eyes so there are several terms that may be related to eye or infectious diseases of the eye so First, um, let us define what we mean by conjunctiva, conjunctivitis, and keratoconjunctivitis. You can see here, conjunctiva is a loose connective tissue that covers the surface 
of the eyeball or what that's what you call the vulvar conjunctiva and it reflects back upon itself from the inner layer of the eyelid so the inner of the eyelid is actually referred as the pul the palpebral conjunctiva now the, this tissue firmly adheres to the sclera at the limbus where it meets the cornea okay so that is the conjunctiva so any inflammation that happens uh, within the conjunctival anatomical site, we call it conjunctivitis. Now, what's the difference between conjunctivitis and keratitis? So, if conjunctivitis is obviously the, the infection or the inflammation of the conjunctiva, keratitis is the inflammation of the cornea. So, keratitis is the infection of the cornea. So, this is now your cornea. Okay? So, as you can see, it is the clear dome-shaped tissue on the front of your eyes that covers the pupil and the iris. So, keratitis may or not, may not be associated with an infection. Okay? So, if the, in, if the inflammation or infection um, actually spread from cornea to the conjunctiva so that particular term is called kerato conjunctivitis regards to the infectious of the respiratory system now we all know for a fact that the respiratory system can be divided into two parts so we have the upper respiratory tract which includes your paranasal sinuses the nasopharynx the oropharynx the epiglottis and the larynx now the lower respiratory tract would include your trachea, your bronchial tubes, and the alveoli of the lungs. Now, in the upper or at the upper respiratory tract, um, there are actually indigenous microbiota. So when we say indigenous microbiota, it means that these particular microorganisms normally reside at our upper respiratory tract. So it means that um, they actually comprise the normal ecological niche of microorganisms at our upper respiratory tract. However, in some cases, they may even cause opportunistic infections of the respiratory system. So when you say opportunistic infections of the respiratory system, we are referring to the supposed normal microbiota that take advantage of hosts with weak immune system. So for example, patients with AIDS, patients who are undergoing chemotherapy or patients who have just received or uh, life-saving renal transplant because they are also drinking immunosuppressive drugs. Okay. On the other hand, the lower respiratory tract infections are the most common cause of death from infectious diseases, especially nowadays because of the COVID-19 pandemic. So majority of patients who are being intubated are actually uh, suffering from LRT or lower respiratory tract. So again, let's review. So the upper portion here, okay, from here comprises your upper respiratory tract infection and here comprises the lower respiratory tract, okay? So the infectious diseases of the respiratory uh, system uh, it's very common, okay? So that's the reason why you have to be familiar with the anatomical part and obviously when you say uh, bronchitis, of course, um, that refers to the um, inflammation of the bronchial tree, okay? So that's the anatomic side, okay? Um, epiglottitis, um, of course, that refers to the epiglottis. Laryngitis refers to your larynx. The sinusitis refers to the sinuses, and then pharyngitis refers to the pharynx. Now, let us uh, let us discuss um, what's the difference between pneumonia and bronchopneumonia. Okay, so when you say pneumonia, pneumonia is an infection that inflames the air sacs in one or both lungs. So as you can see, no, um, our lungs are made up of air sacs, the alveoli. So whenever there are infections in the air sac, primarily speaking, we call it pneumonia. So the air sac may fill with fluid or pass, 
So if it's with, if it's filled with past, so that is actually the purulent materials causing um, the patient to cough with phlegm or with past, and it is often be accompanied by fever, chills, and difficulty in breathing. Okay, so a variety of microorganisms, including bacteria, viruses, and fungi, can cause pneumonia. Although nowadays, because of the pandemic, many many are actually scared of the SARS-CoV-2 or the COVID-19 disease because, of course, a manifestation of that particular disease is the presence of pneumonia. Now, what do we mean by bronchopneumonia? So, okay. so bronchopneumonia is actually specific because it's a type of pneumonia that causes the inflammation in the alveoli itself. So, someone with bronchopneumonia may have trouble breathing because their airways are actually constricted already. So due to inflammation, um, the, the, their lungs may not get enough air. So that's the reason why um, it's very important that uh, you know you have this very handy oximeter. And of course, your SpO2 should actually be um, 95%. Okay? So symptoms of bronchopneumonia may, may range actually from mild to life-threatening severe infection. About the infectious diseases of the oral cavity. So the oral cavity is a complex ecosystem suitable for growth of many types of microbes. So the microbiota of the mouth varies from one person to the next, and it consists of 300 identified species of bacteria, both aerobic and anaerobic. But it is noteworthy to mention that majority of, of bacteria that can cause dental caries are actually anaerobic bacteria and perhaps the most common of which is streptococcus mutants okay so dental caries are actually uh is the inflammation or it's an infection or it actually uh it is more you are actually more familiar with tooth decay so actually that is that refers to um dental curry so whenever you have tooth decay or dental caries it means that um it, it is actually caused by the breakdown of the enamel that protects the pulp of the teeth. Okay, so this breakdown is the result of bacteria on teeth that breaks down the food and produce acid that destroys the tooth enamel. So whenever the tooth enamel are being destroyed, um, slowly but surely it will reach the pulp. And by the time that it, the destruction has reached the pulp, that's the time that you will feel tooth aches. Okay, so the most common um, bacteria that can cause destruction of the animal are those that are capable of producing lactic acid. So lactic acid producing bacteria and even streptococcus mutants are actually the most common causes of dental caries. Which one is worse? Is it dental caries or periodontal diseases or periodontitis? Actually, periodontitis is actually much worse as compared to dental caries. Why? Because when you say periodontitis, okay, um, it is uh, more commonly known as gum disease. Okay, it is actually a serious gum infection that can damage the soft tissue and without treatment, it, it can even destroy the bone that supports your teeth. So it reaches up to the connective tissue. Okay, so periodontitis can cause teeth to loosen or it will lead to tooth loss and at the same time periodontitis is common but they are largely but it is largely preventable now is it different from gingivitis yes gingivitis is a common and mild form of gum disease so if it's serious it's more of gingivitis but if it's um a mild form so it is uh if it's serious it's periodontitis but if it's a mild form then it is a gingivitis so it causes irritation redness and swelling of the gingiva okay the red is soft tissue okay that supports your teeth okay so the part of your gum around the base of your teeth okay so it's important to take gingivitis seriously and treat it properly so again since it is mild Having gingivitis is preventable and at the same time, it's still a reversible condition. Now, what is a trench mouth? Okay, so when I say trench mouth, it is a quickly progressing infection of the gums marked by bleeding and then swelling, pain, ulcers between teeth, 
and of course the death of the gum tissue. Okay, so the possibility of death or whenever the tissue is actually de uh, somehow decaying, we call it necrosis, okay? So the possibility of death to the teeth supporting structures, okay, marks the trench mouth. Okay, so a more advanced and serious form of gingivitis. So it's another variation of gingivitis, but it is actually a more serious form because necrosis has already taken place. Okay, now let's talk about um, the infectious diseases of the gastrointestinal tract. So transient and resident microbes continuously enter and leaves the GI tract. Okay, let's differentiate that. What do we mean by transient and what do we mean by resident? So when you say transient, they are not permanent resident of our gastrointestinal tract. Whereas when you say resident microbes, they are actually permanently residing in our gastrointestinal tract and somehow establish ecological niche in our gastrointestinal tract. Now, are they important? Yes, because once these particular resident microbes have already established ecological niche, they comprise the beneficial microbes and prevent harmful microorganisms in thriving from thriving in our gastrointestinal tract. So most microbes okay, would have difficulty in, in colonization of the gastrointestinal tract because they are destroyed in the stomach and duodenum because of its too much acidity. And perhaps you might be asking, if they are being destroyed in the stomach, how come they can still cause infection? Well, the most common route is, of course, through ingestion by means of a vehicle. Now, in the parlance of gastrointestinal tract infection, when we say vehicle, this pertains to food and water. So microorganisms are being protected whenever we actually uh, uh, drink. Uh, what can I say? If whenever we, we drink or we eat contaminated food, they are not, some of them may be destroyed, but some of them may even survive the acidity of the gastric juice whenever they are with water or with our food and thereby can cause infection. So there are different terms that are related to the infectious diseases of the gastrointestinal tract. So let's discuss them one by one. So here, colitis. Colitis is a chronic digestive disease characterized by the inflammation of the inner lining of the colon. So again, that's the inflammation of the colon. So infection, loss of blood supply in the colon, inflammatory bowel disease or we call it that IBD, and invasion of the colon, colon wall with collagen or lymphocytic WBCs are possible causes of inflamed colon. First, everyone is familiar with diarrhea. So diarrhea is very common, happening in most people in few times each year. So when you have diarrhea, you would expect your stool to be loose and watery because there is a failure of water reabsorption in the large intestine. In most cases, the cause is unknown and it goes away on its own after a few days. However, there are some serious diarrhea that would really require intervention such as electrolyte replacement. Okay, diarrhea can be caused by bacteria. It can even be caused by viruses, even by some amoeba. Okay? So dehydration is a dangerous side effect of diarrhea. So that's, the reason, that's the reason why I told you a while ago, in serious cases, there's a need for us to have um, electrolyte fluid replacement therapy to address um, severe electrolyte loss that can be life. So dysentery is an infection of the intestines, okay? That causes diarrhea. So there's also diarrhea. However, this diarrhea doesn't the, the stool that you'll have in dysentery is not just watery, but it also contains blood or mucus, okay? So other symptoms of dysentery can include painful stomach cramps, okay? Feeling sick, or there is also vomiting. So it's actually a more serious uh, form of diarrhea. And usually, if, if it's bacterial, um, it, it may be caused by Shigella, if it's protozoan, then it may be caused by Entamoeba histolytica. Neuritis is the inflammation of your small intestine. So again, we will be using some of the terms that we previously discussed. So, okay. So, 
if the if the if the inflammation can also involve the stomach okay we call it gastritis okay um if it involves large intestine then we call it colitis so there are various types of um, um enteritis because it could either be um viral or bacterial therefore if you if you have heard of the term gastroenteritis uh, we can see that it is a short-term illness triggered by the infection and inflammation of the digestive system in general okay so symptoms it can include again um, abdominal cramps diarrhea and even vomiting so some of the causes of gastroenteritis uh, would include um, viruses um, bacteria um, the toxins uh, produced by the bacteria parasites particularly chemicals and some drugs may even um, trigger gastroenteritis familiar with the term hepatitis so hepatitis is actually an inflammation of the liver okay so inflammation is swelling that happens when tissues of the body are injured or infected such as the liver so it can damage the liver so this swelling and damage can somehow affect our liver function so majority of people um, with hepatitis um, we have jaundice or the yellow discoloration of the skin and sclera so as you can see here no infections of the GI tract uh, may have multiple causes so such as food drugs viruses bacteria protozoa or even some helminths okay so this uh, particular illustration here from mouth up to the anus uh, made up of made up the gastrointestinal tract okay now let's talk about the urinary tract infection so again UTIs can be divided into two so we have the upper UTIs or the infections of the kidneys and ureters and then we also have the lower UTIs um, infections of the bladder urethra and prostate so there are also various terms that we need to be familiar with whenever we discuss urinary tract okay so this includes the following it is is the inflammation of the bladder itself okay so usually caused by the infection in the bladder so it's a common type of uti and particularly in women and is usually more of a nuisance than cause for serious concerns so mild cases will often get better by themselves within a few days. But of course, in some cases, you will need to start with antibiotic therapy. So in nephritis, nephritis is a condition in which the nephrons, the functional unit of the kidneys, okay, become, became inflamed. So this inflammation, uh, uh, sometimes um, we, we are more specific, uh, we use, sometimes we use the term glomerulonephritis, can adversely uh, affect the function of the kidneys and in worse cases some may even warrant on dialysis particularly if glomerular filtration is already affected okay now ureteritis is different from urethritis okay so do not get confused with the term so ureteritis is the inflammation of the ureter so it is rare and most of the time it is also associated with either cystitis or pyelonephritis. Nephritis is the inflammation of the ureter. Urethritis is the inflammation of the urethra. So urethra is the tube that carries the urine from the bladder out of the body. So it is usually caused by an infection. The term non-gonococcal urethritis is usually used when the condition is not caused by the sexually transmitted infection by seria gonorrhea. Hepatitis is a group of conditions that includes acute and chronic bacterial prostatitis and chronic pelvic pain syndrome or sometimes we call it as the CPPS. So it can cause infection, inflammation and pain in the prostate gland itself. So majority of men with asymptomatic inflammatory prostatitis don't have symptoms however in some cases there might be acute or sudden prostatitis in medical emergency nephritis so it's actually a kidney infection so it is a type of again another type of uti and it generally begins in the urethra or bladder 
and it travels to one or both of your kidneys. So, a kidney infection requires prompt medical attention. So, pyelonephritis is a serious condition. So, the most common cause of cystitis and pyelonephritis is Escherichia coli. And the most common cause of urethritis is Chlamydia trachomatis. So, it is an example of sexually transmitted infection or STI. So, again, as you can see, um, this is the, the anatomy of the urinary tract. So, really, you guys uh, would really need to brush up on your anatomy. So, let's talk about the this time the more specific to the infections of the genital tract. So, terms relating to infectious diseases of the genital tract would include the following. So, let's discuss them one by one. Tertolinitis is the infection and inflammation of the major vestibular glands or the Bartholin's glands. Okay, so what's the function of the Bartholin's gland? Okay, so it's related to lubrication during sexual intercourse. So they are found in the lower third of the labia majora, particularly on their inner side. We say cervicitis, it is the inflammation of the cervix, okay, the end of the uterus. Okay, so cervicitis um, often does not cause um, symptoms, but if they do happen, they may include abnormal uh, vaginal discharge, okay? There will also be painful um, sexual intercourse or vulvar or vaginal irritation. So, antibiotics uh, may somehow be utilized in treating cervicitis in most. Arthritis is the inflammation of the endometrial lining of the uterus. So, uh, in addition to the endometrium, inflammatory may in inflammation uh, may involve the myometrium and occasionally the parametrium. So, endometritis can be divided into pregnancy-related endometritis and, of course, there could also be endometritis unrelated to pregnancy. Dynitis is inflammation uh, which may include swelling and irritation of the epididymis. So, Epididymis is a tube at the back of the testicle and its primary function is to carry the sperm. So this swelling can cause intense pain in the testicle and it can occur in men of any age. So though it mostly happens between uh, if uh, men between the ages of 14 and 35 years. Okay, now this time PID or the pelvic inflammatory disease is an infection of the women of a woman's reproductive organs. So, unfortunately, pelvic inflammatory disease is a complication often caused by sexually transmitted diseases such as chlamydia and gonorrhea. So, other infections that are not sexually transmitted may also cause PID. The term that we will be using here is vaginitis. So, vaginitis is actually a term that we are describing or it is used to describe various disorders that can cause infection or inflammation of the vagina. So, vulvovaginitis refers to inflammation of both the vagina and the vulva. So, yung vulva is the external female genital. So, these conditions can result from an infection caused by organisms such as bacteria, yeast, and viruses. You can see, sexually transmitted diseases um, include any infections transmitted by sexual activities. So sometimes, these include diseases not only the genital and urinary, urinary tract, but other areas of the body as well, such as the skin and mucous membrane. So STIs can be in the mouth, um, if the person was involved in the uh, in oral sex, or it may even be at the anus, okay, in cases of anal sex. Okay, so again, you really have to be familiar with the anatomy of the male and female reproductive. Now, let's talk about the infectious diseases of the circulatory system. So, the circulatory system consists of the cardiovascular system, so this includes the heart and various vessels, and of course, the lymphatic systems, which may include the lymphatic vessels, the lymphoid tissue, and the lymphatic fluid itself. So the term 
relating to the infectious diseases of the cardiovascular system includes endocarditis, myocarditis, and pericarditis. So let's discuss them one by one. It refers to inner, okay? Because endocardi endocarditis is the inflammation of our heart's inner lining. So it is um, the inner lining of the heart is called endocardium, okay? So it's usually caused by bacteria. So when the inflammation is caused by infection, so such as by bacterial infection, the condition is called infective endocarditis. So endocarditis is uncommon in people with her with healthy heart. So that's the reason why we have we have to keep our heart strong. Heart strong. Okay. Endocarditis is the inflammation of the heart muscles. So the the muscle of our heart, um, we call that the myocardium. So um, there are many people uh, who have uh, myocard uh, myocarditis. So usually, um, um, whenever we say that that person died from MI, we call it myocardial infarction. So in lay term, um, it is often referred as to cardiac arrest or heart disease. But again, it's actually more specific because there has been an infarction at the heart muscle itself. Um, is it different from pericarditis? Actually, um, somehow they are related, but they are distinct from one another. Pericarditis is the inflammation of the pericardium. So the pericardium is a very thin sac or membrane that surrounds the heart. So somehow it's related to myocarditis because myocarditis refers to the muscle. Pericarditis refers to the thin sac that covers the heart. Okay? So the pericardium holds the heart in place and of course it helps the heart to work properly. So there is small amount of fluid between the inner and outer layers of the pericardium. Okay, so we call it the pericardial fluid. Okay, and we usually extract it by means of pericentesis. Okay, now of course, um, whenever blood circulates in our body, normally they are sterile, except of course, in cases of sepsis, whenever uh, it means that there is already a bacterial infection, okay, in the blood vessel. And we you know um, viremia is the presence of viruses in the blood, um, fungemia is the presence of fungus in the blood, and then, and even there are parasitemia or the presence of parasites in the blood. Discuss lymph adenitis. So, when we say lymph adenitis, it is a medical term for enlargement in one or more lymph nodes. Usually, lymph adenitis is due to infection. So, lymph nodes are filled with WBCs and you know, WBCs are very important because they are supposed to help our body fight infections. Now, when lymph nodes become infected, it's usually because an infection has started somewhere else in our body. Okay, so what's the difference between lymph adenitis and lymph adenopathy? Well, to start with, lymph adenopathy is defined as an abnormality in size and consistency of lymph nodes. While the term lymph adenitis refers to lymph adenopathy that occurs from infectious and other inflammatory processes. So, lymph adenitis, therefore, is an example of lymph adenopathy, though, to be more specific, Lymph adenitis is due to an infection. Okay, so lymph node enlargement is common finding on physical examination of children. Okay, now how about lymph angitis? Angitis is an inflammation of the lymphatic system, uh, of course, which is a major component of our immune system. So our lymphatic system is a network of organs, cells, ducts, and glands. So these glands are also called nodes and can be found all throughout our body. So if there is an inflammation in any part of the lymphatic system itself, so the general term that we are using is lymphangitis. Okay, so again, as a review of our anatomy of the heart. So this is the anatomy of the heart. Okay, so let's now proceed with the infection of the central nervous system. So, the nervous system is composed of the CNS, which consists of the brain, the spinal cord, and the three membranes, okay? And the peripheral nervous system, or the nerves that branch from the brain and spinal cord. 
So again, there is no indigenous microbiota of the nervous system, so we do not expect to have a normal microbiota of the nervous system. So again, there are several terms that we are using in relation to infectious diseases of the CNS. So let's discuss them one by one. This is the inflammation of the brain. Okay, so there are several causes, but the most common is a viral infection. So encephalitis um, often causes um, a mild flu-like signs and symptoms such as fever or headaches. So there are no symptoms or sometimes um, there, there's no symptoms at all. So sometimes uh, flu-like symptoms can be really severe. So again, um, encephalitis is actually hard to treat. Uh, in fact, very rare people um, would usually survive from viral encephalitis. So that's why um, prevention is better than cure. So there are vaccines available to treat some kinds of encephalitis. Encephalomyelitis, okay, is the inflammation of the brain and spinal cord. So not just the brain, but it also includes the spinal cord. So again, um, there are various types of encephalomyelitis. So we have the so-called acute disseminated encephalomyelitis or post-infectious encephalomyelitis or when you say um, encephalomyelitis um, it is a demyelinating disease of the brain and the, spinous, and the spinal cord and it is possibly triggered by the viral infection so again when you say demyelinating um, that's, uh, remember that nerve fibers are actually being covered by myelin sheath so in cases of this inflammation um, this myelin sheath uh, is inflamed and somehow destroyed so they call it demyelination okay now let's proceed with the term meningitis this is an inflammation of the brain uh, sorry inflammation of the protective membranes covering the brain and the spinal cord so particularly called that meninges okay so it's a protective covering that protects our brain and spinal cord so a bacterial or viral infection of the fluid surrounding the brain and the spinal cord will usually cause swelling. So, however, injuries, cancer, certain drugs, and other types of infection may also cause meningitis. So, usually to, to diagnose it, we usually collect CSF or cerebrospinal fluid by means of a lumbar tap. The, the term meningoencephalitis is also known as encephalomeningitis um, it is also a term that we are using to describe an inflammation of the brain and its surrounding protective membranes. So it resembles both meningitis and encephalitis. So meningoencephalitis um, can be caused by bacteria, viruses, fungi, and protozoans, and as well as a secondary, as a result of secondary sequel of other inflammation like AIDS or acquired immuno deficiency syndromes. We say myelitis or sometimes um, it is more appropriately termed as transverse myelitis or TM. Um, it is a disorder caused by the inflammation of the spinal cord itself. So it is characterized by symptoms and signs of neurologic dysfunctions in motor and sensory tracts on both sides of the spinal cord. Okay, so there you have it. The different terms that we are using in relation to infectious diseases of the nervous system. So again, as I review, this is the these are the anatomic structures of the central nervous system. Okay, the meninges and the related structure. Okay, so infections of the CNS having multiple causes. So again, um, when you say meningitis, it is the inflammation of the meninges, and there are several causes, including the ingestion of poisons, ingestion or injection of drugs, reaction to a vaccine or a pathogen. Okay, so there are three major causes of bacterial meningitis. So we have Haemophilus influenzae, particularly the one with type B capsule. So that's the reason why HIB, H-I-B, okay, is actually, um, uh, it is caused by an encapsulated Haemophilus influenzae and it can be prevented by means of vaccination. And there is also um, Neisseria meningitidis, okay, the one that can cause meningococcemia. So Neisseria meningitidis is, is actually commonly known as meningococci. 
and then of course streptococcus pneumoniae. So these are the three major causes, bacterial causes of meningitis. Okay, so let's talk about opportunistic infection. So when you say opportunistic infections, we call them, uh, we call opportunistic pathogens as opportunists because these are microbes that usually do not cause disease, but they have the potential to cause diseases under, under certain conditions, particularly or more specifically if the host becomes immunocompromised. So they will take advantage of hosts with weak immune system. So common opportunistic infections include aspergidosis and other mold infections. So they can cause fungus ball in the lungs, um, candidiasis, uh, can, they can cause thrush, okay? And then cytomegalovirus and herpes simplex infection, these are viral infections. And then tuberculosis, malaria, toxoplasmosis. And more common among AIDS patients are also Mycobacterium avium and pneumocystis girovecchi infections. Okay, so these are all, this can all, these particular bacteria, viruses, and these microorganisms in general uh, may be life threatening for those people with weak immune system. So nowadays we have um, examples of emerging infections. So, which means that um, somehow they become dormant and recently. They are, now, they are now emerging. So this includes your H1N1, even influenza, but among the one that is listed here, the most worth, noteworthy to mention is the SARS. So perhaps um, this particular art, uh, slide was published in 2015. Perhaps um, they were referring to SARS-CoV-1, but nowadays, again, the, the reason why we have a pandemic is due to the SARS-CoV-2 virus. SARS-CoV-1 occurred in 2003. So who could have imagined that 2019, so about 16 years after, there would be another SARS that is now causing wrecking havoc and is now causing a pandemic. Now, re-emerging infections means that they had re they had emerged before. You emerging kasi, these are, uh, what's the difference between emerging and re-emerging? Time first. So when we say emerging infections, um, emerging diseases, emerging diseases are those whose incidence in humans has increased in the past two decades. Okay. However, when you say re-emerging, re-emergence is the reappearance of known disease after a significant decline in incidence, um, more appropriately known as the return of the comeback. Okay, so this includes um, cholera, dengue, diphtheria, malaria, Rift Valley fever, tuberculosis, yellow fever, and infections caused by MRSA, methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus, and other superbugs. So when you say superbugs, those microorganisms that have become antibiotic resistant. So there you have it. Um, this is the end of my lecture. So again, please do not forget to study and stay safe. God bless everyone.